To know me is to caffeinate me. Hello and welcome to another video. My name is Heather and as always I'm reading with a vengeance and I hope you are as well. If you're an OG watcher, thank you so much for coming back. If you're new to my channel, very warm welcome to you. I hope everybody is doing very well. How is everybody's reading going? I am having a really good reading year. This is the second month <laughs> in a row that I'm able to say that. A couple of admin things first. So OG, <laughs> I had a watcher ask me in the comments what OG stands for. And the actual OG stands for original gangster. But how it's used in kind of slang is you've been here a long time. You were the first one, a plank owner, if you will. You have been watching me since the beginning. That's how I interpret it for purposes of my channel. Next in admin that I want to address is I forgot to mention in my January wrap up, this is February wrap up, right? In my January wrap up, I forgot to mention that I had read Malibu Rising and My Darkest Prayer in January. And those were two off of my 23 and 2023 books. So I want to kind of keep track of which books I read off that list, just so I can kind of stay on track with that list. As you can see, I am still in the short-term rental. I mentioned in my last video that that was going to be my last video recorded in this space. As you can see, that's not the case, but that doesn't mean that there's bad news. There's actually really, really good news. My husband and I closed on our house a couple of days ago, so very excited, very good news. We're super happy about that, but what I didn't take into account when I was doing kind of the countdown of when we were going to close on our house and how long I was going to be recording here. If you've been following my channel, you know that when we sold our house in Connecticut, the last four months that we lived in Connecticut, we lived in a trailer, a an RV, a caravan, if you're from the UK. And we only took just a very, very small portion of our belongings with us in, in that rig. We put the rest of our stuff our furniture, the rest of our clothes, and we put it in storage. And now our waiting game is when our storage is going to be delivered. So that is kind of a fun little game that we play in the military. If you know, you know. So we're just kind of waiting to see how long we're going to be without our stuff. I do know for a fact that the very the next video that I will be recording will be in our new house that it may or may not have a bookish aesthetic to it. It might just be a blank wall behind me. I don't know. But this is definitely the last video that I'll be recording here. I considered doing a vlog as far as the whole process, but it was the whole process leading up to the closing was super, super stressful. And while I felt the urge to kind of tell you and talk to you about it as my friends out there to to just kind of vent all the struggles that I that we had, I didn't feel like that was going to be I don't know, entertaining and enjoyable for you. <laughs> so, I mean, here and there, I might share with you some of the struggles that we had, but I'm not gonna, I don't think I'll do an entire vlog. But I will do, like, when I get some shelves and I start putting books on the shelves, I'll probably do some extra videos for that. And then, speaking of the next video that I'm gonna record, I follow the Women's Prize for Fiction. And if you follow it too, you know that the long list is going to be announced on March 7th, which is next week. And I am going to do, I wouldn't say not so much a reaction video, but I am going to record my finding out what those books are. And then I'm going to discuss those books and I'm going to talk about maybe which ones that I've read so far, which ones I want to read. And then I'm also going to have a very exciting announcement during that video that that pertains to the Women's Prize for Fiction. So I wanted to throw that out there now. I, I started following the Women's Prize for Fiction, I would say in 2020. Well, 2021, I discovered it, really. And then last year, I, for realsies in earnest, started following the prize. And I absolutely love it. I had such a good time last year with following the prize and reading the books that were in the long list and the short list. I really look forward to doing it again this year and I, I hope you come along for the ride. And like I said, huge, exciting announcement next video. 
All right, so let's get on to, oh my God, I'm 10 minutes in. I know I'm gonna edit a lot of that out, but, but geez, babble much? What we're here for is my February wrap up. Now, I usually do a mid-month wrap up and I didn't, obviously, I didn't do that this month. Not only was it a short month, but while I read 11 books in the month of February, I can't talk about three of them just yet because I am a judge for the BookTube Prize, which I've mentioned in a previous video. And I've read three of the books. I've been assigned six books. I did a video for which six books I was assigned. I'll link that down below. I was notified at the beginning of February, and then I have until the end of March to read those six books. So of course I split it up, three books in February, three books in March. I did read those three books which I'll talk about in just a second, but I can't really review them here. I can't tell you my reaction to them. I can't even tell you that I liked them until after the end of March where everybody has submitted their rankings because we don't want to put any bias out there. You get the idea. Anyways, because I was reading these three books that I wasn't going to be able to talk about uh, in February, by the time February 15th happened, I'd only read four books and then I would only be able to talk about two of them. But the good news is I have eight books to talk about in this video. What I plan on doing is doing a separate wrap-up video with the BookTube Prize books that I read for February and March. And that'll come out within a day or two of my March wrap-up. Does that make sense? Is that about clear as mud? I don't know if you guys, if this happens to you, but if I go through a, a prolonged stressful period, as soon as that thing that I'm stressing about happens and it's over and I'm able to relax, I get really sick. It's almost like my immune system says, I've had it. Here you go. Here's some snot for you. So it's a Wednesday today. We closed on our house on Monday. I've been sick ever since. I'm better today than I was yesterday, but I still have a little bit of brain fog. So bear with me. <laughs> the three books that I read for the BookTube Prize in the month, month of February that I can't really talk about, I read Demon Copperfield by Barbara Kingsolver. As you all know, I was very apprehensive about reading that book because I have not had a good track record with Miss Kingsolver, and I can't wait to talk to you about it. I also read Memphis by Tara M. Stringfellow, which is a historical slash literary fiction, also a debut novel. I also read How High We Go in the Dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu, which I was also apprehensive about because I don't have a really good track record with short stories, and this is a collection of short stories. I am very, very excited to talk to you about those books. However, I will not be doing so in this video. So let's get on to the books that I read that I can talk to you about. The first of which is Bunny by Mona Awad. Wow, you guys, this book. Now I know lots of people talk about it on BookTube. It's all over the place, right? You have your group of people that love it. You have your group of people that hate it. But the thing that is consistent throughout is everybody has a WTF moment with this book. I certainly did. To be fair, I read this book because of all the hype, because of everybody talking about it. And not only because of everybody talking about it, but their, their reactions to this book. I read the physical copy. I just so happened I sold it on Pango. And I knew I should have waited to put it on Pango because it went up and sold like within 24 hours. I usually like to have the physical book if I read the physical book to have it here to touch and show you, but it's neither here nor there. This is a horror fantasy. You're following Samantha and she is an MFA student at Warren University. You see what they did there. She's kind of a loner. She has her best friend, I believe Ava is her name. They kind of march to the beat of their own drum, kind of stand in corners at parties and judge everybody and make fun of everybody. Specifically, they make fun of a group, a clique of girls who collectively call each other the bunnies. And they're very twee. They have their hair just so, they wear just so clothes. And I think of like mean girls meets clueless, but they have a mean streak. So one day, the bunnies invite Samantha to their little workshop, their little bunnies only get together against her better judgment. She goes and she becomes a bunny and things go a little nutty. And the story goes from there. I can tell you some stuff that really gets at the meat of the story, but they would be spoilers and I don't want to do that. At its core, it's really a story about loneliness and then needing a sense of belonging. And in this case, Samantha, she becomes a part of this group and she 
is enjoying that feeling of belonging to this group. But at the same time, she's losing her sense of self. She's losing her grip on reality. And the way Mona Awad does this in her story it was very unique. Now, to be honest, I almost DNF this book because I'm, I was reading it and reading it and I'm like, what the F? What the F? What is happening? It's like a fever dream. You just don't know what's real. You're like, what is what is happening? The writing is such that there was no way I was going to be able to put this thing down and not find out where it was going. And I did. And I'm glad I did. It was one of the most unique stories I've ever read. And once you figure out what Awad is trying to accomplish here and you have that aha moment, it makes for an enjoyable read. And I use the word enjoyable loosely. <laughs> I had a fun time with it, but I was disturbed at the same time, if that makes sense. And this is a book that deals with mental health, with loneliness, with that feeling of belonging that we all crave at least some at some point in our lives. It also explores grief and isolation. And it was just... Is it worth the hype? Yes, I believe it is definitely worth the hype. Also, there were many references to writing that I think if you're a writer, you will enjoy a little bit more than, say, me who isn't a writer. But I guess being enough of a reader, I was able to recognize those references. But I think if you're a writer, you will absolutely be thrilled by those references. Yep, definitely read this one because of the hype. But fortunately, it was worth the hype. I gave this one four stars. Next up is Secondhand Souls by Christopher Moore. This one was picked in my TBR video as a random pick from my physical library. I've had it on my shelf for a really long time. This is the follow-up to A Dirty Job, which I read many years ago. Enjoyed it very much. This one was fun. I read the physical copy. I wish I had the physical copy with me. I did pack it up, and it was one of the things that I brought over to the new house. But the cool thing about this cover, not only is it beautiful and bright and pink and all that, it is glow in the dark. And let me tell you something I found out <laughs> in kind of a scary way. I always read right before bedtime. Reading this book, put it down on my side table, turned off the lights, reached over, kissed my husband goodnight, and then turned back over and faced my nightstand. And before I close my eyes, I see this image of this skeleton baby on a rocking horse glowing in the dark. I almost peed myself, but really, really cool. <laughs> so what is this? I would say this would be categorized as wacky urban fantasy. You're following Charlie Asher, who is in the first book, and I don't want to spoil the first book. I highly recommend the first book. But without giving too much away, Charlie Asher's soul is kind of trapped in this, <laughs> in not his body. He His soul is in this creation that his girlfriend, Audrey, has made for him. And that's kind of the, the whole plot of the book. In this series, which I think is called The Grim Reaper, in this Grim Reaper world, when people die, their souls are collected. And that is the way of the world. That's the normal course of events that should happen. But in this story, people are dying and their souls are not getting collected. And it's creating havoc in San Francisco where this takes place. And so the gist of this story is that Charlie and Audrey and this madcap group of characters, his friends that he works with, they're going to come together and figure out what's happening. Now, the plot really isn't the best part of this book. It's the characters. Christopher Moore has a very, very unique and fun way of compiling his characters in these books. His characters are just, they're hilarious. And his dialogue, hilarious. Laugh out loud funny. To be fair, I had a better time with A Dirty Job, but I'm glad I read this one. Like I said, the plot was okay, but the it was the characters that really kept me going. I did kind of lose the thread of the story at times. I think the fantasy element kind of lost me in a couple of places, but I enjoyed it. It was it was an okay, it was an okay book. I gave Secondhand Souls 3 stars. Next up is The Things We Cannot Say by Kelly Rimmer. This one was selected for me in my TBR video as well because the category I believe was subscriber recommendations and this one was recommended by Eileen. Her channel is called Nelia476. Thank you Eileen for this recommendation. I listened to this book. This is a historical fiction surrounding the events of World War II, specifically the Holocaust. Now full disclosure, The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna and Beneath the Scarlet Sky by Mark T. Sullivan 
I have been ruined for historical fiction novels surrounding World War II. Those are two of my absolutely favorite books of all time. And every other World War II historical fiction novel has paled in comparison. Now, I enjoyed this book. This was a good story. You have two timelines, two separate points of view. In the present day, you're following Alice. Alice is a woman. She's married. She's got two children, one of whom is on the spectrum. And she's got a very hectic life. She is taking care of her two children. Her husband is a workaholic and doesn't quite contribute as much as he should. And they are struggling in their marriage. Alice's grandmother is in the hospital. She has suffered a stroke. She has lost her ability to speak. And they discover a way to communicate with their grandmother with the iPad that Alice's son, who is nonverbal, speaks through this app that's on the iPad. And by touching icons, he's able to communicate. And through this communication on, on, on this app, Alice's grandmother is asking Alice to go find Tomas, which is Alice's grandfather who died a year ago. So Alice's grandmother is saying, go to Poland, find Tomas. And she's not being really specific because her mode of communication is very limited. But th that's the gist of it. And Alice is like, I can't, I can't leave my family. And then the other point of view is Alina. And Alina is a young girl in Poland during the time of the Nazi invasion. Alina and her best friend and the boy that she intends to marry, Tomas, are finding ways to survive during the Nazi occupation. So you're following Alina. She has been kind of recruited through Tomas and Tomas's friends to smuggle a piece of film out of the country that will kind of shed light to our allies on what the Nazis are doing in Poland. And then you're going back and forth in time, Alice's point of view and Alina's point of view and how those stories connect. I enjoyed the story as I always enjoy a good World War II story. I will say it was lacking a little bit in uniqueness. There was a twist in the story that I did enjoy that kind of raised that uniqueness level for me. I also appreciated about this book that the atrocities of what happened in the Holocaust were mostly implied and not necessarily on the page. I know a lot of people kind of shy away from stories like this because they don't need that spelled out for them. And I totally get that. You know something terrible has happened, but you don't necessarily have to read it on the page. I don't mind it if it's on the page, but I don't need it either. If I didn't mention before, I did listen to this one. It was a really good audiobook. The narrator did a really good job. I was never confused on which point of view I was following. Uh, so it was very straightforward. I thought it was a very middle of the road story for the most part. That twist did raise it up a level. So I gave the things we cannot say three and a half stars. Next up is Sharks in the Time of Saviors by Kawhi Strong Washburn. I have been super excited to read this book. To be honest, I bought it completely for the cover. Look at this cover. It is glorious and beautiful. This was picked on my TBR uh, as just a random pick from my physical library. And I'm super excited about it. Anyways, what is this about? It's a contemporary fiction slash magical realism story that follows a family who live on the big island of Hawaii. It's mother and father and three children. One day, they are all out on a boating trip. And Nainoa, who is also known as Noah, he is, I think he's around five years old. He's the middle child. He falls off the boat and there are sharks in the water and all the people on the boat are like, oh my God, he's going to be attacked by these sharks. Dad jumps in to try to save him. Instead of what everybody expects to happen, one of the sharks takes Nainoa in his jaws and gently brings him back to the boat and to his father to safety. From that day forward, they believe Nainoa has these special powers uh, based on myth and legend and folklore of Hawaii. And for a long time, people will come to their house, and want to spend time with Noah because they believe that Noah has the power to fix whatever is broken. Noah's family allows this to happen. They don't ask for money, but they accept money. And it happens at a really good time because Noah's family is extremely poor. They're one of those families where they don't need material things and the latest and greatest of technology or any of that to be happy. They're this 
wonderful family that find joy in the very smallest of things, the very simplest of things. Once this thing happens with Noah and they start to earn money based on what Noah is doing, they're able to move off the Big Island. They move to Oahu. Ultimately, it starts to tear the family apart. And the story goes from there. This book is told in multiple POVs. You get mom's point of view and you get all three kids' point of view. You don't get dad's point of view until the very end, which I thought was interesting. But essentially, you're finding out what happens when one child out of the three becomes favored and becomes viewed as special and important to the family dynamic. And so you're finding out how that affects the other two children. So this is a debut novel, and I'm pretty impressed by it, actually. I think the story is a unique one, and I really enjoyed it. The synopsis on the back, which basically tells the shark story, I think it leads you to believe that the shark incident has more to do with the story than it actually does. But ultimately, the the bulk of the story is the family dynamic and how that incident affected everybody else and how it affected them, them over time. And I actually really, really enjoyed that family dynamic. I enjoyed following the older brother's story and the younger sister's story. There's a lot of talk about um, Hawaiian folklore that I didn't enjoy so much, but only because I don't think Washburn did a very good job of explaining that folklore to appreciate the reference. I think if you are from Hawaii, I think you will enjoy this book a lot more. What I did enjoy was all the descriptions of Hawaii. I've been to Hawaii twice. It's an absolute magical place. It was almost like I can smell that beautiful, distinctive aroma that is Hawaii. The descriptions of the trees and the flowers and the fruits and the food and all of those descriptions I absolutely love. I found myself immersed and found myself like just about to push the the button on Expedia for my trip to Hawaii. (laughs) Now, as per usual, I don't want to spoil the story, but there's something that happens to Noah about midway through that I don't understand how it added to the story. I don't appreciate what happened. If you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. The big thing, I don't think it should have happened. I don't think it adds to the story. I don't understand why it was put in here. That is my main critique of this book. But ultimately, I did I did enjoy it. I didn't love it. I would recommend it. But just be warned, it's more about a family dynamic and less about the magic of what happened with the shark incident. <laughs> I gave sharks in the time of saviors three stars. Next up is Signal Fires by Danny Shapiro. I buddy read this book with the lovely Gemma over at Gem of Books. I had a fantastic time buddy reading with her. So thank you, Gemma. I read the physical book and this is my first Danny Shapiro. This is a contemporary fiction. It opens up in 1985 and you have three teenagers who have been drinking and they're in a car and they get in an accident. One of the teenagers is killed. Another teenager, Theo, who is, I believe, 15 or so and should not have been driving. He was driving. And then you have Theo's sister, Sarah, who's in the back seat. Sarah ends up telling a lie regarding the accident that affects everybody involved for the rest of their lives. This book is told in multiple timelines. You're kind of going back and forth in multiple timelines. It is told in multiple points of view. You're following Theo's point of view. You have Sarah's point of view. You have Ben, who is Theo and Sarah's father, who's also a doctor, who's also the first on scene. Ben and Theo and Sarah are the Will family. And across the street, about... 15 years after the accident, a young family moves in. You follow their son's point of view, Waldo, and you also follow Waldo's dad, Shankman. Their last name is Shankman. Why he's referred to as Shankman, I don't know. Waldo is, I would say he is on the spectrum and he is super fascinated by space and the stars and that really annoys his dad for some reason. Waldo and his dad are just not connecting. One night it comes to a head, Waldo runs away from home. It is in this particular timeline where Waldo runs away from home, he comes into contact with Mimi, who is Ben's 
wife who is suffering from dementia and she has walked away from the care home that she's in and they connect. The story goes back and forth from the accident and how it affects everybody and then those effects and how these two families connect. Primarily, I think this is a story about how trauma affects individuals so differently. You have Theo who, as he gets older and goes on through life, he's just not able to get it together at all in his life. He ends up leaving town and he moves out of the country and he doesn't contact his family for five years. He basically kind of goes on a walkabout and finds out who he is and what he wants to do with his life. Then you have Sarah, who on the surface looks like she's got it together just fine. She has a successful career. She's got a marriage. She's got children. She's got this beautiful house. However, she's dealing with addiction and her marriage isn't so happy as it appears on the surface. Shapiro explores these different effects of trauma that I found very interesting. I would say the secondary theme of this book is that everyone is connected. The way Shapiro writes how these two families who live across the street from each other, how they're connected, I thought was really beautiful. I really appreciated that. It, this is a slow moving story, but I felt connected to the characters. I cared about what happened to them, specifically Theo, specifically Waldo, who is just a very endearing character. His friendship with Ben, I really, really enjoyed that. I loved how that story unfolded. I would recommend that you read the physical book as opposed to listening to it. I found that reading the physical book, it, I, I felt like I had to flip back and forth a couple pages to kind of remind myself of what happened when, because there are multiple points in time that is addressed, not to mention the multiple POVs. So there's a lot going on, a lot of moving parts, and I feel like if you listen to it, it, you might lose the thread. At least I would have. Shapiro has a really easy reading style. I enjoyed that. I will definitely look into other books by Shapiro. I feel like I didn't really give a great description of what happens in this book because of the multiple points of view, so I apologize for that. So I'll just leave you with the fact that, yes, I recommend this book. It is slow moving, but the characters are engaging enough. And if you appreciate a story that highlights how we're all kind of connected, I think you will enjoy this book. I gave Signal Fires three and a half stars. Next up is Fox 8 by George Saunders. Now I hadn't planned on reading this book. I had never heard of this book, but I kept coming across it at the library when I was searching for Liberation Day by George Saunders, which is one of the books that I am to read for the BookTube Prize. I kept seeing Fox 8 and it was this teeny tiny little book. It's actually a short story, but just one short story in hardcover. I thought, well, why not? I've never read George Saunders. I might as well. 48 pages and it was really really cute I really enjoyed it it is basically written from the point of view of a fox and it just tells the story from a fox's point of view the impact that humans have on our environment really it's just that simple you know it's almost like a little diary entry by a fox so the spelling of some words are done in a funny and clever way I will say though I mean most of it is laugh out loud funny a lot of it, of course, I really, really appreciate it as an advocate for being kinder to our planet. I found it very heartwarming. It had a way of shining a light on just the despicable behavior of humans, but not doing it in an offensive way. You kind of find yourself reading the story and going, yep. <laughs> so yeah, I really, really appreciated that. There are some really cute scenes in here where I laughed out loud, super, super cute, but I also, there was a part in here something happens to one of his little fox, fox friends that is super sad heartbreaking I choked up I am super sensitive when it comes to stuff like that but it's just part of the story that needed to be told ultimately it's just I mean he fit into 48 pages so much super super important message without feeling like you're watching a Greenpeace commercial I recommend it. It's 48 pages. You can read it in a half an hour. <laughs> you can read it just standing there in the aisles of your library. I gave Fox 8 four stars. Next up is Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. Yes, yes, I succumbed to the hype. 
the hype, you guys. Is this a cute cover? It absolutely is a cute cover. It is a cute title. It's got a cute premise. But in all fairness, would I have picked this up if it weren't for all the hype on BookTube and Instagram? I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have picked this up. That's not to say I didn't enjoy it. I will mention this is also one of my subscribers' recommendations. Leanna, thank you so much for this recommendation. No shade on you, I promise. <laughs> so just a real quick recap because this has been talked to death all over BookTube. This follows Viv, who is an orc, who by her very nature, she is a warrior. Her life is all about getting into battles and she just leads a life of violence. And she comes to a point in her life where she just wants something better. She does, she's done shedding blood. She wants to hang her sword up and just have a different life. She goes into a cafe in this town and she discovers coffee for the very first time. And in this fantasy world, which if you can't tell by this cover, this is a fantasy novel. <laughs> But in this fantasy world, coffee's kind of a new thing. She has her first sip and she falls in love, which I completely appreciate. So she decides to hang up her sword. She goes to a new town and she decides to buy a structure that she turns into a coffee shop. The story goes from there. If you are super, super into fantasy, you probably really adore this book. I am not super, super into fantasy. I thought it was cute. I thought the characters were cute. I thought the story was cute. And this really is about found family and following your dreams and friendships and loyalty and what we do for each other as friends. And I appreciate all that. I will say that while all the characters were super cute, very well written, I don't connect to fantasy characters. If I do, there's an, there might be an exception. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I don't connect to orcs or trolls or gnomes <laughs> the way I connect with dogs and humans. I will say though, because of my love for coffee, I rated this an extra half, half star because of how coffee was characterized, how it was described, how her falling in love with coffee was described. I was totally able to relate to it. One of the characters, I think Thimble is his name, he hit it right on the head. There's a scene in the book, Thimble is about to get started in baking some samples or something like that. And he says, but first coffee. And that is many, if not all coffee lovers motto in life. Really, that's what I enjoyed the most in this story, to be honest. I listened to it and it was narrated by the author, Travis Baldry. And he did a really, really great job of narrating it. And I think one of the benefits of an author narrating his own story is he captures his characters perfectly. They were all very individual, very distinct characters, very distinct voices. But like I said, it is cute. I enjoyed it. Was it worth the hype? All the hype that it's getting? Come on. No, I feel like this is one of those books that is overhyped. Is that redundant? This would have been a three-star book for me, if not for the descriptions of the coffee. So I gave Legends and Lattes three and a half stars. Finally, for February, I read Heartstopper Volume 3. Now, if you watched my last couple of TBR videos, in both videos, I had selected the category of best rated on my Goodreads TBR, and Heartstopper Volume 3 came up. And I was supposed to read not only Heartstopper, but since it was just a graphic novel and I'd be able to get through it quickly, read the next best rated one. What ended up happening was I initially forgot to read Heartstopper, and then when I did my TBR for March, I realized when I got the best rated on my TBR, I saw that Heartstopper was still there and I got like a deja vu. And I'm like, wasn't this picked for me last month? And I didn't read it. And so since I had a couple of days left in February when I did my March TBR, and since I found it at the library and I read it for February. Anyways, Heartstopper Volume 3 by Alice Oseman. I have been enjoying this series. Super, super cute. I'm not crazy, crazy in love with it like everybody is. It's got a great theme. It basically follows uh, Nick and Charlie who are in high school. They meet and fall in love. These books are dealing with discovering your own sexuality. Uh, Charlie already knows he's gay. Nick doesn't realize it until he meets and start, develops a relationship, a friendship initially uh, with Charlie. You're dealing in those types of themes as Nick is realizing that he is bisexual, what it means to be a teenager and coming out and telling your family and how it affects not only the people around you, but 
you as an individual. I like the way Oseman handles it in graphic novel form. It's easily accessible. It's not quite as heavy as it can be. There's humor in it and it's written super cute. The illustrations and the artwork is, it's just, it's simple, but effective. However, I will say about volume three, it's my least favorite of the series so far. And here's why. Volume three, when I pulled this off the shelf, I was shocked by how thick and heavy it was. It is like 350 pages, which I want to say is at least about 100 pages more than the first two in the series. And I thought to myself, when I saw how thick it was, I thought, oh, there must be a lot going on in this book. I was really excited about that. But really, there isn't. This is 300 pages of the struggle of coming out and, and going public with his relationship with Charlie. And while that is a topic that is interesting in and of itself and absolutely should be covered in the story, it was 350 pages of Oh, have you come out to your friends? Have you come out to your family? No, not yet. I plan on it. And oh, it's so hard. And, you know, and then the next day, oh, have you told so-and-so about us? Have you told so-and-so about your sexuality? And oh, oh, no, it was just back and forth and back and forth the same struggle repetitively and not really delving into it, but just saying that it's a struggle, which I get it. There's a couple of other themes that are addressed in here, but maybe for a page or two, a little bit of homophobia, of course, a little bit of mental health. You're starting to touch on the very surface of one of the main characters uh, possibly having an eating disorder that is barely touched upon for a couple of pages. But the rest of this giant graphic novel is the struggle of telling people about your sexuality and telling people who you're in a relationship with. And I get it is a struggle and it is an important thing to talk about, but I felt like it was dragged out over 300 pages and it didn't need to be. I feel like it took away from the story rather than added to it. So I was a little disappointed by that. One of the things that I enjoyed about this is it does a really good job of illustrating the cuteness that is first love, especially first love as a teenager. Super, super cute. You know, they're giggling together, their embarrassments that they share with each other. They're just getting to know each other and how, how embarrassing that can be sometimes. It's captured really well in this. But like I said, this is not my favorite of the series so far. I am, I do plan on reading the rest of the series and I'm glad I picked it up. I gave Heartstopper Volume 3, three stars. So that is it. Those are the books that I read in the month of February. Have you read any of these books? What did you think about them? What books have did you read in the month of February that you are absolutely in love with? I would love to hear about it. Or you can just say hello down in the doodly doo. If you're still watching at this point, please consider giving that like button a boop and a subscribe would be wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.